Okay, it's almost starting. Is, is Duarte your first name or Grasa your first name? Yeah, Duarte. Duarte. Okay, can you hear me? I think. Yep, I hear yeah. you well. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so I think we can now start. Um, I want to, uh, first of all, welcome uh, everyone that um, watches this, uh, this session as it happens and everyone that watches this later. Uh, so this is the 27th session of IAPS at a Distance. Uh, and today's topic is astronomy. And to uh, address this, this topic uh, and the, the organization they're representing today, we have with us um, Chad Hall and Nicolas uh, Lira, uh, whom I take the opportunity to already thank for accepting the invitation to participate in this session. Uh, and I would start with uh, introducing our speakers and then uh, give them the, the word to, um, to do their initial uh, presentation. So Chad is from upstate New York in the USA and received uh, his bachelor's in physics at the University of Virginia in 2006. After teaching at the high school level for two years, one year in Virginia and one year in uh, San Mateo Ixtatan in Guatemala, he attended the University of California, Berkeley, where he received his PhD in astrophysics in 2014. Uh, from that year until 2017, he was a Jensky Fellow of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory based at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. From 2017 until now, he has been a project assistant professor of the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan based at ALMA headquarters in Santiago, Chile. Um, and we also have with us, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Nicolas. Uh, he is Education and Public Outreach Coordinator at ALMA, uh, a journalist with prior experience on TV press, um, has an associate degree in sciences prior to um, his bachelor's degree in journalism, so he's a perfect fit um, for this work on uh, science outreach. Uh, he has lived in France and Chile uh, and joined the ALMA um, Education and Public Outreach team in 2013. And now I, uh, as I had mentioned, want to give you the word for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Duarte. Right. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to just uh, say a few words before chat starts. Uh, so this is we're doing together, but actually it's Chad's uh, talk. But he's uh, as he's in upstate New York, he doesn't have like a very good connection to share the screen. So I'm sharing the his presentation over. And I, I will be doing the, the slide presentation, but he will be uh, talking because he has a good connection over the phone. That's why uh, this uh, weird uh, configuration. Uh, so uh, I thank you very much, uh, the IAPS, for the invitation, of course, in the name of Alma. And uh, of course, uh, the talk will, will last about 30 minutes, and then we, we can open for questions. And I'll be here for to support uh, chat at all times, even in the questions or uh, whatever you you may need. Okay. You can leave the questions over the YouTube uh, comments or over the chat inside the Zoom, of course. I'm watching both of them. All right, fantastic. So, Nicolas, you want to share your screen? I'm on it. All right. Okay, 
here we go. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks to the IAPS for the uh, for the invitation, and thanks for the nice introductions from both Nicolas and from uh, Duarte. Um, this is an unprecedented time, as we all know, and uh, never before have I ever given a presentation on my phone, much less standing outside and with support from my colleague one continent away on Zoom. It's really kind of crazy, but also amazing that all of this can work. So I think uh, that's the positive side of all this. And I'm happy to give this presentation to you now. Uh, again, I'm a, uh, an astronomer working for the uh, Japanese Observatory, but based down at ALMA. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about ALMA today in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So Nico, you wanna go to the next slide? So this is a satellite picture of Northern Chile. And you can see, if you know what Chile looks like, a long skinny country down the Western side of South America, you can basically see that the cloudless region is Chile. <laughs> and you have here a little marker where Alma is. It's just near the border of Bolivia and Argentina. Argentina. Um, and uh, it's kind of almost up into the top of the mountains, but not quite. And you can see that it's in this zone this highly preferential weather zone, really unique in the world, that allows uh, the astronomical observatories that exist there to get the incredible data that they do. The, the kind of smooth air off of the Pacific Ocean, which I can't really explain to you in, in detail from meteorological terms, but the, the location of Chile, plus the mountains, plus the ocean in the northern part of the country really allow uh, world-class observing. And that's why a huge fraction of the world's major observatories, including ALMA, are located in this region of the world. And so we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the implications of that in a few slides. So ALMA, next slide, uh, is a, an interferometer. It's the Atacama Large Millimeter Slash Submillimeter Array, with array being the key word here. Of course, submillimeter is also a key word, which I'll also talk about later. It's 66 antennas and they're all working together. So you'll see in the next slide, a, uh, a basic configuration here. So a little cartoon in the top that says in Spanish, uh, some of these uh, slides are gonna be in Spanish when necessary, I will translate that back into English. So it says up here on the top, all of the antennas work together. And you can see a, a cartoon idea of what one of the configurations of the 66 antennas on the Chachnantor Plateau of the Atacama Desert, which is what you saw in the satellite photo, would look like. And then in the bottom right, you can see the actual photo of the antennas with some kind of cartoon details of, of the, uh, the, the physics and, and geometry that's going on when you, uh, when you use ALMA. But one uh, very technical term that I wanna introduce you to right here is the term aperture synthesis which literally means synthesizing an aperture, where an aperture is just an opening, basically the telescope itself. But you have this, this plane on which you put all of these quote unquote little telescopes. They look little in this picture because you're seeing kilometers and kilometers of land, but they're actually relatively large. They're 12 meters, which you can see in the bottom right photo. But with ALMA, we don't just want to see what we can see with one antenna, we wanna get much better fidelity. And we do that by synthesizing a telescope that is the size of that entire array. So you can see they're kind of oriented on the plane of the, the plateau in an approximate circle, more or less. And that having them spread out in ways that I will describe later allows us to get much higher resolution images than we would if we were just looking with one particular telescope. So keep that in mind, aperture syn synthesis. We're putting these telescopes all over the ground and we're then piping the light that they receive from the cosmos on fibers back to the thing that you see in the lower left, which I'll describe in a minute, which is called the correlator. And that processing that happens in the correlator then allows us to synthesize this, this telescope that is much larger than one that we could ever build ourselves. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Nico. So here you have uh, the kind of basic comparison of what's going on here. You have on the top, a popsicle, an eyeball, and a brain. That's the human um, observational technique. You see the popsicle that you want to eat when it's really hot in the summer. The light that's bouncing off of that popsicle goes into your eye, specifically through the aperture of your pupil. And then what you see gets processed by your brain, making you think, ah, that looks tasty. I want to eat it. So think now scientifically, you look at the bottom, you have the cosmos on the left. 
And then this one antenna, which I show you here, but notice there are three other little antennas that you can see next to the big antenna. So you have not only one, but many, 66 to be exact, antennas looking at whatever particular object you wanna look at, a planet, a star, a nebula, a galaxy. And they all observe this at the same time. And then the brain part is this little cartoon correlator on the right. And now you can see the real one, I believe in the next slide. Excellent, ALMA correlators. So it turns out that there are two parts of ALMA. There is the, the main array, which are the 12 meter dishes. I, refer, I keep referring to the 12 meter antennas because that's the diameter of the main antennas that you've seen so far. There's also the MARITA array or the ALMA compact array, the ACA. You can see that acronym there in the upper left. And there are 12 of those antennas. They're smaller and they're extremely useful for reasons that I will explain later in the talk. But basically you have these two components of, of ALMA. They have two separate correlators because they're, they're different. The telescopes are, are, are different, though they can work together in the same correlator actually. And this correlator is just a fancy name for a huge supercomputer that is taking all of the, uh, the information that's coming from each of the telescopes, again, brought all the way many kilometers up to about eight, yeah, I believe currently eight kilometers in length uh, on a fiber, a fiber optic cable. They're all plugged into this machine and it produces the, uh, the data that we then can image with our software to produce the incredible things that I'm gonna show you at the end of the talk. So this is the brain of the system, which you can see here in the upper right. And it's located in this building that you can see in the lower left picture. You can see a, a gentleman checking out the system here in the, the center bottom picture. And then in the, uh, the lower right, you see some of the amazing mountains up near the Chaklantor Plateau and the, uh, the technical building that is up at the actual high site, up at 5,000 meters. And so that's where all the good stuff happens uh, when, we're, when we're taking the data actually up at the site. So next slide, please. Now, to give you an idea of where we fall in the, uh, the spectral domain here, so here's the electromagnetic spectrum, which many of you all who are tuned in have certainly been introduced to in some form. This is just another form for you to, uh, to study. And the top, you have this number line that's the wavelength in meters. So this is a, kind of a, a logarithmic scale and factors of 10. You get some, some uh, things that you might see in real life that are approximately the size of these things like the soccer field or a baseball or a cell, a bacterium, an atom. And you can then see the, uh, the names of the parts of the spectrum toward the middle of this plot. On the left, you get radio. So this is, when I say radio waves, it really encompasses a huge range. It goes all the way from, from AM radio, FM radio, to just maybe centimeter wavelengths, which are the uh, getting into the microwaves that your microwave oven uses, that your cell phone uses to communicate, that my own cell phone is using to transmit this talk to you. <laughs> ALMA is at a little bit shorter wavelengths. It's around the millimeter. So that's why ALMA is called the millimeter submillimeter array because it's probing wavelengths that are between a few millimeters in length and almost into the far infrared, a few hundred microns in length with an average of about the size, as it says here, this period, that's about a millimeter. Um, and so that's kind of the, the average of where ALMA has its, um, its observational capabilities. And there are, there are implications to looking in this regime, which I will talk about. So you go to the next slide for me. Now, why do we want to observe not only with ALMA, but also with other wavelength regimes? We wanna do that because you can see different physics. So when you look at different wavelengths, you're, getting, you're always getting light, right? But you're getting light that is caused by different physical processes, some cold, some hot, some energetic, some not so energetic, some from molecules, some from atoms, some from dust. So you're seeing lots of different things when you look, for example, with Chandra, that's an X-ray telescope, which you can see in the upper right. All of these images in these little bubbles are showing you the very famous merging pair of galaxies called the antenna galaxies. And, uh, but they're looking at very, very different wavelengths. You can see the X-ray in the upper right, the VLT, another telescope we're very proud to have in Chile, the very large telescope. It's an ESO telescope uh, near ALMA, in fact. Um, in the optical, you have uh, Spitzer, in the, I would say, mid-infrared, mid and far infrared in the upper left, that was another telescope mission. And then at the bottom left, you have ALMA. So that's looking at the longest wavelength of all of these. 
And the good part about it is that with Alma, you can see things that you cannot see, for example, in the optical. So if you go to the next slide, what you will see is a zoom in of the antenna galaxies. So now we have here on the left, Alma, on the right, VLT. And then in the next one, we have the overlay. And if you look at the overlay, you can see that the VLT optical image shows you a lot of the, the high mass bright stars, the things that are not obscured. But actually, Nico, can you go back one slide? Now, if you look at the optical all by itself, you notice what you've probably seen when you looked at uh, images of, of our own Milky Way. You get these kind of long, skinny, dark lanes. And what those are, are dust. Dust in star forming regions that actually obscure everything that is behind them and inside them. And so now if you go back to the overlay, you can see that the, uh, the Alma image, um, one slide, Nico, the overlay. The Alma image, thank you, um, shows you information in the region of the VLT optical image that you can't see. So basically Alma is looking deep into the regions of star formation where it's very, very cold and very, very dense, where you can't actually access with uh, telescopes at shorter wavelengths. So there's really a synergy uh, between all of these telescopes at different wavelengths. And Alma allows us to, as we like to say, probe our cosmic origins, especially when it comes to the formation of stars and planets, which happen in these really, really cold, dense, dusty, gas, gaseous regions. So now in the next slide, I will talk about why Alma is where it is. So I talked about the millimeter and the submillimeter. Turns out that the atmosphere is your worst enemy uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to to observing at these wavelengths. And every every um, every different telescope has its own enemy. Optical telescopes have the enemy of light pollution, so they want to go far far away from people. Long wavelength radio telescopes like the VLA, which you see second from the bottom there. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the longer wavelength array of my, my previous wonderful employer, the NRAO in the US. They want to get far away from people, not because of light pollution, but because of uh, radio interference, RFI, such as cell phones and, uh, and cars and radio and satellites. And with Alma, we don't care so much about light pollution or, or people or, or RFI. What we really care about is the atmosphere because a, a lot of the, uh, the light that we can see is very efficiently absorbed by water in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And so we wanna go as high as possible. Long wavelength radio telescopes wanna go far, far away from people, say to the middle of the desert in South Africa. Millimeter telescopes wanna go high, high, high up. And so at about 5,000 meters at the high site, we are above about half of the atmosphere. And so it really improves the transmission, which you can see in the next overlay the transmission of the light at all of the various wavelengths that Alma can observe. So you see here, this is uh, uh, one of our uh, few technical plots in this talk. This is transmission as a function of frequency. So you can see here about the factor of 10 in gigahertz that Alma can observe. And the numbers on the top X axis are the names of the bands, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those are the bands that exist, though we have bands one and two coming up, which are gonna start at about one centimeter. So you're really gonna go from, um, about uh, 30 gigahertz up to almost a terahertz. And you can see that this curve, so there's this continuous curve with dips. That's the transmission curve, where if the curve is up toward the top of the plot, you get all the light. Whereas if it's down toward the bottom of the plot, like these incredible dips between bands eight and nine and nine and 10, those are essentially complete absorption of the light in those frequency ranges by the atmosphere. And so you can see that we actually build the ALMA receivers to cover the uh, the frequency ranges where the transmission is is the best, and so you have you know band three right at the peak of this uh, this transmission around 90 gigahertz, and then again four five six seven. There are a few little dips in there that we try to avoid when we're observing, but uh, in general we have put the receiver bands where the atmosphere is the nicest to us. But you can see this descending trend as a function of frequency of the transmission is the reason why once you get into the far infrared, mid infrared, you really need to have space missions. Uh, space missions like Spitzer, where I showed you the picture of the, the galaxy before, um, that was a space mission. The upcoming JWST mission from uh, NASA, again, is a space mission. And one of the current only functioning far infrared telescopes, SOFIA, is actually an airplane. It's an airborne telescope that gets much, much higher than ALMA, probably about 10,000 meters, I think, when uh, a typical 30,000 foot flight. So that's, uh, that's why we put ALMA where we put it. 
and now we will continue on in the next slide uh, to talk a little bit about resolution. So I mentioned at the very beginning this idea of aperture synthesis, where we're synthesizing a telescope much larger than we could ever conceivably build just due to cost and mechanical failure of a dish that is so large. And so you see here three, three beings. You have here a spider, an aranha, on the left. You have Talma, a, uh, a, a character who, whose uh, cartoons you can look up on the amazing Alma Kids website, which uh, Nicolas will uh, tell you more about at the end. And then an owl, a buo. So on the left, a spider has very tiny eyes. And so nitidez, that word there is sharpness. It really can't make out things that are particularly uh, fine-grained. Whereas a human, all of us are human beings, and uh, we can see things with reasonable resolution. And then you have an owl, which has unbelievable resolution. And you can see kind of in this, these affected images that as you go from left to right, the eyes get bigger. So this is the idea of getting a larger and larger aperture to get a better fidelity image. Now to put that in mathematical terms, we put the one equation, there we go, that I always put in my, in my talks here, resolution. So if you've taken basic physics classes, you have learned at some point that resolution is proportional to the wavelength of your observations divided by the opening or the aperture that you're using to do those observations. So you have here your nice sine curve. The wavelength is just the peak to peak, trough to trough, zero to zero point. And uh, resolution I simply define here as theta, though you can use many other Greek letters for it if you like. And lambda is the wavelength, the wavelength of the observations and D is uh, in the case of the previous slide, the diameter of the pupil of the eyeballs. So ours uh, for a human being is a few millimeters. For an Alma single dish antenna is uh, 12 meters. And for, um, for the entire array can range up to about 16 kilometers. So if you go to the next slide, Nicolas is going to kindly um, slowly walk you through the various configurations of Alma. So what this is showing you, is a note that it's logarithmic because when we pack the antennas really close together versus when we have them really far apart, if we were to show you an actual satellite image of the antennas really far apart, you wouldn't be able to see any of the ones in the center. So this is logarithmically scaled. And what we're doing here is physically moving the antennas to different places on the plateau so that we can see different things in space. This is uh, one of the unique features of interferometers is the fact that we actually move the antennas because when you keep them packed in the center, so Nicolas, if you can go back to C1, when you put them all very, very close together, almost so close that they're touching, what we do is we get kind of low resolution because remember it's lambda over D. So if D is small, resolution is, it's theta is big, which means that your, your resolution element is large, which means that you can't identify tiny features. But one of the benefits of, of doing this is that when you pack all the antennas close together, you actually have the ability to what we say recover larger scale structures. Whereas the opposite of this, so now Nico, if you can go to C9, if you go all the way up to the longest configuration, and this is really what, what Alma was built for. We can do all kinds of awesome science with low resolution, but the really groundbreaking stuff that came out and continues to come out comes from these long baselines, so-called, uh, we call them long baselines, where a baseline is the, uh, the distance between a pair of antennas. At this configuration, you can get incredible resolution. So you can see very, very, very tiny features, but you're actually not able to see large, angular scale structures. We, what we say in, in the world of aperture synthesis interferometry is we say we resolve out the large structures. So there's, it's kind of a, a benefit and a curse of, of an interferometer that you can kind of pick the scale that you wanna see, but you can't always see all scales. And uh, that's a reason why we actually have this smaller array of telescopes, which I'll talk, just to, uh, talk about in a, little, um, in a little while. So now I'm following on my own computer here. So next slide. I mentioned that we move these telescopes physically. Um, it's kind of an incredible process. So I worked for an interferometer previously. It was amazing enough seeing them haul around the smaller antennas uh, back, uh, back when I was working in grad school, but the Alma antenna moves are a sight to behold. <laughs> so these are the two antenna movers, which you can see behind our cartoon Talma character. 
they are, uh, and Nicolas, please correct me if I'm wrong on any of these, these data points. They're a hundred tons and each antenna is a hundred tons. So the combined creature there on the left is 200 tons of metal. It has two engines, one of which is to move this gigantic beast as it moves the antenna from one pad to the next. And another is actually to keep the antenna cool. So basically we're plugging in the antenna to this other engine so that it doesn't warm up. And I'll tell you what that means in a few slides. These movers can move at about 12 kilometers per hour maximum when they are unloaded and only five kilometers per hour when they have an antenna. So this is kind of a, a long process, especially when you're moving many, many kilometers. And um, I think, uh, I think any more cool data points about uh, about the the movers, Nicolas? Yeah, yeah, they have a they have twenty eight wheels. That's right. Thank traction you. on <laughs> they can move the twenty eight wheels independently by hydraulic systems, so they can actually like rotate themselves in in place. They can move really, really, really precisely, like millimetrically precisely, to to put to locate the antenna exactly where where we want it. And they can they can they can be controlled uh, over remote control. The driver gets off the vehicle when he loads or unloads the antenna, so he can see what he's doing and doesn't damage the system. That's it. Absolutely. But you just say, well, yeah. Hey, thanks, Nicolas. So just for all of you out there with uh, with you know Subarus, think about your traction control and then think about this. This is another level. <laughs> all right. So the next slide. I mentioned the second engine and uh, the need to keep the antennas cold. So I don't mean keeping the entire antenna cold. I just mean keeping the guts of the antenna cold. So these are the receiver cartridges. It's really kind of fun for me to see these because I actually worked on receiver development and testing for the Karma interferometer. This is the previous generation interferometer that I have mentioned a couple of times from uh, uh, in Southern California. And they had very similar receivers. So I've, I'm familiar with them. Um, with some of these. And each of these cartridges, which you can see a little bit um, to scale on, on the left-hand photo where you see the person's hand, there may be a few dozens of centimeters in height. And each of them costs about 100,000 euros. And so these are, these are serious pieces of equipment, expensive ones, uh, which have very, very tiny parts. And those tiny parts are ultimately the, they're called the receivers. So they're the, the final place that the photons received by the ALMA antenna end up before the information gets transmitted back on the fibers to the correlator, to the, the huge supercomputer brain. And um, the, uh, the inner parts of this need to be kept incredibly, incredibly cold in order for the very weak signals that we're detecting with ALMA to actually be detectable and not swamped by the thermal noise of a basically just a warm receiver cartridge. And so in the next slide, you will see the uh, major mega refrigerator system that we use to keep these cool. So this is the guts of one of the antennas. On the left, you have the, uh, the cryostat. It's basically just the refrigerator. You have all 10 cartridges in this refrigerator. You can see it's multiple stages. You can see the three concentric circles. The innermost stage is cooled to four Kelvin above absolute zero. And uh, only three of the receivers can be powered on at any given time because uh, the, uh, the heat from these actually very high efficiency receivers is enough to warm up the interior of that refrigerator. So you can only have a couple of receivers functioning at a time. And so that's the, uh, that's the guts. Now, on the uh, next slide, I want to finally address the, the scales issue. So I mentioned that one of the benefits, but also one of the, the sort of difficulties of using an interferometer is that you can choose the scales you want um, to look at. Just, just, Sometimes, can I just yeah, add yeah. something before we, yes, please. before we go to the next thing? The, the yeah. cartridge, the, 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 the cryostat goes in the, in the hole in the middle of the, of the antenna, just so they can see, because in this, this picture, you can see this, this hole in the center. This is where all the, all the receivers are. Yes. So the that Excellent. big blue cryostat, it's inside there. Okay, just just so they they know where it is exactly. Yeah. So. And the the diameter of the cryostat, it's about a human almost, like a meter, meter and a half, something like that. Like a a, a little more than a meter, yeah, like yeah. meter. Yeah. So that for scale, like that, that little hole that you see in the telescopes is is half of a person. <laughs> 
Yeah. So what, what's happening with the light, actually, if you want to if you want to think about it in your mind, you have the light coming in from basically a distance of infinity. You hit the main curved part of the antenna, the, the parabola that you can see there. Then that light is focused onto what we call the secondary, which you can't actually see. It's, it's pointed back toward the antenna. That's right. Right where Nico's cursor is. And then that little beam of light is funneled into just one of the receivers. So we have um, we have a little movable, I think the secondary itself is actually movable. So it's like a selector and it can point the beam of radiation into the little, what we call feed horn. It's a little metal horn that in some cases is has an opening of probably less than a centimeter in diameter. And the light goes in there and then into the receivers at four Kelvin. So it's a, it's a process that really brings you from gigantic scales to incredibly minuscule scales on a very, uh, uh, very quickly. <laughs> So these antennas, the reason I wanted to talk about them briefly is not only because they were designed by my host organization, the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, the NAOJ, uh, but because they're smaller. So these are the 12 seven meter antennas of the Morita uh, array, also known as the ALMA compact array, compact meaning you can actually put them closer together. So they're very, very close together. And by virtue of being smaller, you can put them even closer together without them touching. And this allows you to actually recover larger spatial scales than you would be able to with the 12 meter antennas. So the big antennas with lots of collecting area very far apart allow you to get really, really high resolution still at a very good sensitivity. But the ACA, as you can see in this image here, on the left, this is no ACA, and on the right, you've combined 12 meter data with the ACA. And if you zoom in in your, in your zoom window here on the right, you can see that on the left, you see in this particular spiral galaxy, you're resolving very nice, say, star forming clouds in the emission that you can see there in the spiral arms. So you're getting the high def image, but you're missing what you then can see on the right, which is this fluffy sort of large scale halo of, of emission. It may not be a halo necessarily, but it's a, uh, an extended structure, which is simply invisible to the 12 meter antennas. And so there's, there's physics going on, not only at high resolution scales in, uh, in astronomical objects, but there's also large scale structure that is equally important, which we can, uh, we can recover with the ACA. And so that is, um, the final bit about the way things work. Now, the uh, the workflow, before I just give you a couple of science highlights of how ALMA functions in terms of the observatory community is uh, the following. So you see this map here of the world. Each dot represents a location from where a proposal was submitted in cycle five. We're about to come up on cycle eight, but this is basically the same now every year. We've reached a steady state of about 1,800 proposals per year. And uh, it's mainly focused in the, uh, the three regions that contribute to ALMA, which are North America, Europe, and, uh, and East Asia. But you can see, and Chile, I should also mention, the host. Uh, but there are also proposals from, uh, from many, many other places around the world, the Indian subcontinent, uh, Australia, Brazil. There's many, many, many countries that request time and receive data from ALMA. And the way that the flow works, you can see in the next, um, the next slide, it's a truly global operation here. So where I live is, is down in Chile, where Nicolas is right now. So Santiago is the headquarters. If you look at the zoom in here in the bottom left, you can see that Santiago is the, the headquarter offices and a lot of the data processing goes on there, but the antennas are actually up in Northern Chile, about a two hour flight away near Calama. And all of the data that are taken at the telescope are piped down to Santiago and then are processed, some of them, the majority of the data are actually reduced by many of my colleagues at uh, the, the observatory in Santiago. Some of the data are then sent to be processed in the, the three executives, North America, Europe, and East Asia. So I used to be employed by the NRAO working with people who did this in Charlottesville, Virginia, and also in, um, in British Columbia. I now work for the NEOJ where the, the main ARC or the ALMA Regional Center is in Mitaka, Japan, that's near Tokyo. And then there are uh, smaller nodes out there in, uh, in Taiwan and South Korea. And then I have many colleagues as well who work at ESO. So that's in Garshing outside of uh, Munich. And uh, Europe has a, a unique 
system of many, many ARC nodes in many different countries who do some of the manual data processing of particularly challenging projects and support the astronomical activities of their local communities in, uh, in those various countries. So this is a really almost an incredible testament to the, um, the success of global science. And so speaking of science, next slide. Let's talk a little bit about what we do. So why do we spend $100,000 on each of these, these 30 centimeter uh, cartridges? Well, many of you all probably saw this. My jaw hit the floor back when I was still a postdoc at Harvard um, when HL Tau came out. So what you're seeing here is an image unlike any other that had ever been produced by a telescope similar to ALMA. This is a, well, what we used to call a protostellar disk. Now we perhaps appropriately call it a protoplanetary disk. It's in a forming star, HL Tau, which is relatively young. The, the disk is approximately the same size as our solar system. So it will eventually end up in another few billion years. Remember that our, our solar system is 4.5 billion years old. This is much, much, much younger. Uh, it will end up forming a, uh, a planetary system, maybe somewhat like our own, or like one of the uh, other exoplanetary systems that have been discovered. But it's far from that point. It's still very young. And what Alma is doing here in this nice color scale is looking at the thermal emission from dust. So dust is, it's not particularly warm. Maybe it's like 20 Kelvin or something like that. But it emits light, just as we as human beings, being um, about... Uh, you know, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, we, we emit a particular wavelength, in our case, in the infrared. But what you're seeing here is the millimeter radiation from the significantly colder dust. And what you see is that it doesn't look like a smooth disk. It is an incredibly structured, um, well, <laughs> it is a disk, but it has an incredible amount of substructure that after many years of modeling and looking at many other um, many other protostellar disks like this, we see this all the time. And it's very clear that some, if not all, of these rings and gaps and other substructures are caused by forming planets. So we can't necessarily see the embedded planets within, although that time is, is now coming. There's actually one uh, detection of a uh, uh, potential disk around a planet in another forming, uh, forming solar system. But this was one of the first milestones in figuring out when planets start forming, how common is it? And the answer is now that we've looked with many, many, uh, looked at many, many other sources with ALMA, planet formation in this early stage is extremely common. And most of the planet forming disks that we see with ALMA now that we look at very high resolution have incredible substructure. So lots of rings, gaps, spirals, and other things that are gonna keep us wondering for many years. So next slide for a completely different topic. We have Pluto. So this is not an ALMA image. This is a New Horizons image. Many of you all probably saw this on the news a couple of years ago as well. The thing that I wanna highlight here is the fact that uh, New Horizons got three times closer to Pluto because of a phone call that NASA made to ALMA saying, hey, can you all uh, look at, at Pluto for us and get a better position so that we can correct our course and fly by even closer. And so in the end, I think they were able to fly by at, a, at a, an altitude of 12,000 kilometers above Pluto, whereas it would have been something like 30,000 had they not corrected the course. And this is because not, not only can Alma look at the thermal emission from, for example, dust in HL Tau, which I showed you in the previous plot, it can also see the thermal emission from rocky bodies, rocky solar system bodies like Pluto and other um, other objects that my uh, many of my colleagues studied. So that was a cool um, intra-organizational intra collaboration, which yielded even more amazing images than we would have had otherwise. Now, again, another totally different story. We have here a very sweet discovery. So this is uh, a reference to the discovery of sugar in the galactic center. So this is something I really haven't mentioned. I did show you at least one slide with, um, an image of spectroscopy, but ALMA, in addition to looking at dust, which is mainly what, what I study and what a lot of other people study as well, it is a spectroscopy machine. It can look at many, many transitions of many different molecules, typically the rotational transitions of molecules in the cosmos. And that's, uh, that's one, of, one of the ways that it, it makes so many of its groundbreaking discoveries. And this was just particularly cool. People are, are looking at spectral scans 
of many objects in the universe um, looking for different molecules. So there have been many, many papers uh, showing various molecules of, of, of uh, great importance for, for various parts of, of um, cosmic formation and perhaps even you know, leading up to the formation of life. But this was just awesome to see sugar, the actual molecule that you put in your coffee in the galactic center. Um, one of many spectroscopic studies that, uh, that have been enabled by, by almost technology. And uh, on the next slide, I believe, uh, yeah, we are going to talk about arguably the most famous astronomical image ever made. Um, I think that may be true. <laughs> this is the black hole, or rather the photon ring around the uh, the event horizon of the black hole in M87, a nearby, well, relatively nearby massive elliptical galaxy. This is a supermassive black hole, a thousand times larger than even the supermassive black hole in the center of our own galaxy. And this was made by the so-called EHD, the Event Horizon Telescope. ALMA is um, arguably the most important partner in the EHD, but there are many, many other telescopes scattered literally across the globe that work together uh, every year to uh, make observations of objects like this all at the same time. So they're all coordinated and they observe um, the, uh, the same object at exactly the same time. And then they send the, the data back to be processed at uh, the EHD headquarters in Massachusetts. And so by doing so, when you observe at all of the locations across the earth, you get a resolution that is equivalent to an earth-sized telescope. So remember the idea of aperture synthesis where you're moving your telescopes around the Chakalantor Plateau up at Alma, you can achieve resolutions of maybe a milli arc second. So now we're gonna get into angular resolution. So Nico, if you wanna go to the next uh, overlay, you can now see here, we're overlaying scales of tens of micro arc seconds. And those are resolutions that at one millimeter, remember theta equals lambda over D, at a wavelength of 1.3 millimeters, you can, with a telescope the size of planet Earth, achieve a resolution of tens of micro arc seconds. And that happens to be the size of the, uh, the photon ring uh, that is very near the event horizon of the black hole in M87. And uh, the EHT is continually growing. They're adding new telescopes pretty much every year. And so this is, it's not stopping here. This is going to uh, continue opening our eyes to the, uh, the very energetic extreme phenomena that are happening at the, uh, the centers of galaxies and near massive black holes and other energetic phenomena. And so I think, is that it, Nicolas? Or do we have one more? Yeah, all right, my work. <laughs> I was expecting that in the previous slide. So this, uh, just to tell you a little bit about what I do, I've been the, the spokesperson for ALMA telling you how ALMA works and some of the great stuff that ALMA's doing. I myself am an astronomer who works primarily with ALMA. And these are some data from my recent paper, Hull et al 2020A. Um, and this is uh, a protostar. So I, I think I briefly mentioned at some point star formation regions. This is a high resolution image. You can see in, in the, the lower left, it's about uh, a resolution of about 200 AU, which is twice the size of our solar system. And in the middle of this red and blue, right where they meet, you would have, you do have a protostar, which is a very, very young forming star that will eventually turn into something like our sun. And it is powering a, a very iconic bipolar outflow. So the blue and the red are emission in carbon monoxide, one of the rotational transitions that is accessible to ALMA. Again, this is the spectroscopy capabilities of ALMA. And the blue is simply go coming toward us and the red is going away from us. That's how you see this outflow by, by plotting it that way in your, in your plotting package. And most importantly, these little line segments are the magnetic field inferred from the polarization of the dust. So that's mainly my science goal is trying to figure out how the magnetic field affects star formation. And so I look at the polarization of dust, which um, for those of you who, who understand the concept of polarization, you basically have a linear wave, a transverse wave of light. And if it wiggles more in one direction than the other, then it's some percent polarized in that direction. And so that's what we can see that dust in star forming regions tends to be a few percent polarized. And we can detect that with ALMA and thus infer the magnetic field in these regions to try and get a handle on how that affects star formation. And with that, I will conclude. And so now I think we can uh, open it up for questions. That was a little longer than, uh, than I expected, but I think that's okay. Hopefully we still have some time. 
thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for uh, that brilliant presentation chat. Um, and of course, uh, Nicholas as well uh, for handling the, the technical aspects and adding the um, some important information as well. Um, and yeah, now I'll um, I'll start asking you um, some uh, some questions um, that I pre prepared and also uh, sort of popped in my mind as you were presenting. And we'll see if anyone watching um, um, also submits some questions. You're free to do so in the YouTube chat um, or uh, here in uh, in Zoom. So uh, I would first maybe start um, with uh, asking you um, precisely about uh, what you mentioned of the, um, the supermassive black hole um, silhouette observation, uh, which in fact, uh, I mean, I, I do think that what you said that um, it's most likely the, the most famous astronomical picture, uh, I think that's um, extremely likely considering it reached um, everyday life uh, and even politics mem um, <laughs> uh, potential. So uh, it's really likely in terms of communication, I, I do think it reached uh, far beyond um, what usually happens with uh, the work of, um, of astronomers and astronomical observation. Uh, and I would maybe ask you uh, if you could um, maybe um, address a bit more um, the, the complexity of this observation of the construction of the image uh, and why it is in fact so important uh, for, uh, for astronomy that we actually, and physics in general, that we actually got to see something like this. Okay, well, I'm going to address your question backwards. Um, I think that You'd have to talk to somebody who, who studies black holes for them to give you the truly impassioned response to why this is incredibly important. But I would say that, um, you know, as scientists, we're always aiming to test our theories, right? Because they're always theories. They're never necessarily guaranteed fact. And we, uh, one of the, the theories that really has stood the test of time the best is Einstein's relativity. And... Um, that uh, you know, black holes were a really crazy concept when they were introduced, and the ability to actually get you know you're never really going to see the black hole, but what we're now seeing with the EHT image is the effect of the black hole on its very immediate environment, and um, the ability to see that with the observations and then compare with these incredibly detailed um, general relativity, so-called MHD, magnetohydrodynamic models that they had been developing within the CHD collaboration over many, many years. The ability to get really, really nice comparisons between the two allows us to test general relativity in a way that has never before been possible. We're basically getting directly next to a black hole and testing the theories as opposed to um, doing, you know, some kind of more indirect test. So I think from the, the pure scientific point of view, it's the ability to to test the physics at the very edges of one of these incredibly enigmatic objects. Now, as for the complications of the observations, I can actually speak personally to that, having attended as an observer, one of the EHT observing sessions, I think back in 2011 or 2012, back when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, I was at Karma, which then was one of the, the partner telescopes in the EHT. And the whole process was unbelievably stressful, partly because not only do you need to make your own telescope work, which in, in the world of you know, high technology that depends on the functioning of very tiny parts cooled down to 4 Kelvin, it's hard enough making your own observatory work. It's even harder making it work at the specific time that you need to be doing the observations and under the, the uh, unknown weather conditions across the globe. And you will, if you go to the HD website and you actually read about the observations that led to the M87 black hole image, it was, they call it something like an unprecedented time of global good weather, <laughs> which is really important. And it's very, very difficult. You know, you're at nighttime in one place, daytime in the other place, Northern hemisphere in one place, the South pole somewhere else. So it's very, very difficult to coordinate the weather. And then to add one more issue to that, you need to use bespoke technology at each 
of the different telescopes that is never used at any other time of the year except when they're doing the EHD observation. So people actually need to come in and install special equipment, um, <clears throat> employ special software algorithms. In the cases of interferometers like Karma and Alma, they need to actually what we say call phase them up where you're not actually necessarily looking at the black hole interferometrically, but you're pretending now that all of the 66 telescopes at ALMA are working together as one single dish to increase your sensitivity. All of these things are rarely done during the rest of the year, except during testing time. And so it's a, uh, it's a massive undertaking uh, that is even more global than the ALMA collaboration. But as you can see, with perseverance and many years, you can succeed. <laughs> Yeah, I, I may add that the, the data is not directly uh, processed like in, in ALMA. You have the correlator that, that processes the data like live while you are observing. And in the case of the HT, you need to uh, um, transfer that data. You need to first uh, save it on, on a special high speed hard drives, which are specially uh, installed for EHT collaboration. And then the hard drives, you need to move them to uh, to MIT Haystack. In a, you say where it was in in the state, yeah. in the United States, or also there are this this the HT and the GM, GMBA collaboration also in Germany in Bonn. So with the for example South Pole Telescope is the same. They they need to have special hard drives. And once they do the observation, generally they are in April, for example, it's already winter time for South Pole in Antarctica. So you cannot get the, the hard drives before summer out of the telescope. So I, actually in 2017 for the, 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 this observation that made the M87 black hole, I think uh, the hard drives were out of Antarctica in November. So they, they need to wait like six months before getting out the hard drives then put them on a plane then put them and in the, at some point people there's a guy like moving the hard drives with this mega bunch of data from the track to the to the correlator in in haystack and this is one of the the higher broadband you can have a, a guy moving around like <laughs> this tons of terabytes of data just by himself it's it beats every every uh, uh, fiber optics you can have I, I've been uh, like accompanying the observation, M87, uh, HD observation every year in Alma. I, I especially go up to, to see what, how they do it. Are you hearing me? Yeah. 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 The other nice, nice thing is uh, how to say it's like they need to wait for the weather in every, everywhere. And they needed also to install a special uh, maze or a special clock, atomic clock in each. Uh, Alma already had a had a, a really precise atomic clock before EHT, before joining the EHT collaboration, but it wasn't uh, precise enough. So they need to start a maser, a special maser in each of the stations uh, to, to, to be able to, to synchronize the different stations very, very precisely. So this is like, you need to upgrade the, the, the telescope itself to be able to collaborate. That's what I can add. Yeah, thanks. That's great. I was, yeah, the, the idea of FedEx being an incredibly important part that you don't have to think about with Alma, but then, then you reminded me of the the EH or the the South Pole Telescope, where you can't even get the data out. Now it's it's really a logistical undertaking at another level. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, now I, I would maybe ask a sort of a follow up. Um, because this this brings up uh, and we, as we we also mentioned uh, like the the communication uh, and outreach outreach aspect uh, and during the presentation uh, you also addressed a bit the the question of uh, why uh, do we we invest so much uh, in this uh, so um, I want to to ask um, uh, both of you what is the 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 importance um, that is given to personally to commit to to um, efforts to communicate with with the public uh, to uh, promote the 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 findings that uh, 
um, that are that occur uh, to promote uh, the research that is developed uh, from the observations. Um, so what is your um, capacity to do that? Uh, and also, uh, if you could mention maybe what difficulties uh, you may find um, in, you know, in, in a certain way, uh, showing and proving uh, just how important these observations are uh, for um, uh, for the progress of uh, of astronomy, of physics, uh, and even you know contributions to to society uh, at large. You want to start with that one, Nicolas? Yeah. So I'm gonna show you our main uh, websites. I share screen a little so I can actually our main website is this one. So we have uh, two websites. One is like. We, we call it the adult one, we, where we publish all the all the magnificent uh, discoveries uh, astronomers do around the world with our own announcement, like our COVID measures or whatever we need to to tell us the people. We have a, a um, arts residency programs. We have a lot of things going on. You can check all of them in the on the website um, and a lot of different uh, information you will need we are very very active uh, and we have also a kids uh, a kids website where you can find all the Talma this uh, comic you saw uh, around in the presentation uh, has a, about 20 chapters of different uh, aspects how our works how how uh, different discoveries were made and we continuously try to get new ones done. We have also, uh, this This is where, oh, sorry, I put the Spanish one. So this is where the comics are. And uh, you have, we have also this uh, animated series where actually in the, in the second uh, uh, temper, uh, second season, uh, Chad uh, lent us his uh, incredible voice. <laughs> uh, so we have this uh, very short, these are very short videos where some things are explained uh, very easy for kids if you need to 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 understand something in, in an easy way or share it with uh, with your kids or with your neighbors or with your friends who are not scientists this is a very good uh, material and lastly uh, but not the least uh, we have uh, we're very very active on social networks i'm just showing now the the instagram it's alma.observatory where we publish in both language english and spanish but we also have Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, YouTube channel, Vimeo, and we try to put almost everything in different ways everywhere. But if you follow in one of the networks, you will uh, you will be you will learn and you will know what what we're doing uh, all the time. Great. Do you want to follow up on uh, anything, Dwarf? Uh, yeah, well, I would just ask you if you wanted to add anything with, uh, to that. I, I missed the first half of your question, unfortunately, because of the connection. Do you want to, can you sort of re-ask the parts that, Ni that Nicolas didn't, didn't answer? Oh, I, I thought I, I, I had the same problem because I didn't hear the whole question then. Because I thought it... uh, yeah, so it, it was, um, I think um, uh, Nicolas essentially um, answered it because the, the um, although maybe I would uh, ask you to go into uh, a bit of um, uh, a part of the question that was, what are um, like the the difficulties that you may face in terms of convincing um, public of the importance of the observations that you make uh, at Alma, uh, of the importance of this um, this sort of collaboration work. Um, and in a sort of way of um, also, as you mentioned uh, during your presentation, uh, that um, sort of answer that question of why do we uh, invest so much in this? Yeah, that's um, that, that's a very that's a very good question. You know, I will be honest. Working for Alma, I don't have the problem very often of. Um, you know, feeling like I'm I'm on the defensive. I think people people have 
we're very lucky as astronomers because people have an innate um, interest, like a, some kind of born in interest in, um, in all of their hearts and souls about where we come from. And that's our, the tagline that we use for Alma is in search of our cosmic origins, which really, I think it's great because it totally encompasses essentially every aspect of what we do. And I mentioned it during the, during the talk. And it's true that in terms of monetizing what you do as an astronomer, it's not nearly as is common to be able to do so, to be able to, you know, put our research back into the economy. Um, as for example, say a professor in chemistry or engineering or biology where they can do, uh, you know, a startup or something like that. So it's not, it's not always so clear how immediately applicable it is to society from the economic perspective. But people, as I said, I don't actually find myself needing to defend the use of, of, of the dollars that we spend very often because for a lot of people, the search for where we come from, whatever that means to them, you know, where, where all of the gas in the, uh, in the galaxies uh, came from back at a redshift of a thousand, which is what my, my old mentee from UC Berkeley published a paper on just last week, or where our solar system came from, which is more kind of what I do. I look at these baby stars that are then forming disks inside of which planets are carving out gaps and, and ultimately they'll form solar systems. You know, how the solar system came about, how life came about. That's what a lot of my astrochemistry friends are working on. You know, how the building blocks of life um, came together to perhaps um, start forming the, the complex molecules that we need to, to be human, to be, to be living beings. Um, there's a lot of different ways to think about your cosmic origins, but I find that people simply appreciate that. Um, so that's kind of uh, my own personal experience. Nico, have you uh, have you had troubles in your in your days working as uh, the main Alma spokesperson uh, in terms of convincing people why what we do is important? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not the main spokesperson by far, but uh, what I I think is is we, we live in a in a kind of easy time for for astronomy to be like wearing the like wear the nice science right now we don't deal with things around in the on earth so we deal with things are outside earth so people kind of like us and um and especially in in, in chile alma has a very uh, positive uh, well all over the world we have a very positive image so people around the world like like us like so it's kind of very very nice to do it to do science communication from Alma, but the the most difficult part is is how to to make this a massive effort, not just a a, a, a little bit of science communication. That this has a global impact, a, a major impact, and this is what we try to do. It's very difficult because that's uh, like sports or whatever. Uh, politics or conflicts, all of these take out all the the the, the information uh, channels around the world, and science really has like a little percentage of of that attention. And then astronomy, a, a, a small portion of that science portion, and then if you go to uh, ast radio astronomy, it's still a uh, smaller portion. So uh, I think it's. Uh, it's a, 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 the challenge is how to, to do it big. And uh, well, images like, like the black hole image uh, really prove that, that it can be made. I'm not sure we're gonna have like, that kind of opportunities like every year or every two years or whatever, but uh, we need to work on that kind of stuff. And uh, because for example, uh, the black hole image, uh, we had a, a studies and, and it, it reached about in, in the first month about 4,000 million people around the around Earth. It's half of the population of the Earth that actually saw an, an image of science and probably a little explanation, maybe of two or three lines, some of that. But uh, that's already a, a, a quite a big record. And on the on the first day, we had like 1,000, 1 1.5 billion, like 1,500 million. And this is about the 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 
audience of uh, of the final of the World Cup or whatever. So it's that's awesome. It's, that's nice. That's awesome. It's just one day, one month was a year ago. We need to work on how to do these kind of events and and stuff uh, uh, more often. But it's a hard challenge. I think uh, we can. Uh, I need to end up and have another meeting right now. <laughs> so uh, at least I have to to, to disconnect now. But uh, but thank you very much for the invitation, Eduardo. Uh, I, whenever you, you need something from Alma, uh, we are open for, for, for this kind of activity, for whatever you need. And Thanks so much. I, I want to I can... thank Chad also for, for agreeing to, to, to give this talk from, from upstate New York from his uh, re, uh, relaxed time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for the invitation. Eduardo, if you want to ask any more questions, I'm happy to stay on or we can just call it a, call it a day. Okay, I'll, I'll just have a few more I questions. I think we're right. Um, and okay, thank thanks you very much, Nicholas. Bye. Uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just ask you um, a few more questions. Um, so I um, I maybe have um, three three questions that I think are important to, to address um, a bit further. Uh, also because the, um, the purpose of, of this is also to um, you know, try to see if um, um, can eventually convince some people to go into astronomy, um, as we we have been doing for the the other fields. Uh, so um, I want to ask you um, maybe if you could talk a bit about. Uh, of course, you 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 mentioned a bit of your uh, research as well, um, but if you could um, maybe talk a bit about the. Um, dynamics uh, that exists uh, at a, a place uh, like the, the Alma Observatory uh, in terms of the research. Um, for example, do you expect um, like the, 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 the observations that you do right now, uh, the specific focus of your research, um, do you expect that uh, that will be your focus uh, throughout um, your scientific uh, work and career, uh, or is there, um, like, in terms of the dynamics of uh, collaboration like ALMA, uh, do people, like, um, pop a bit from, uh, from focus to focus uh, in terms of the, um, of the observations that are done and of the, um, like, the further work uh, that is built uh, upon those observations? That's a, that's a good question. That's not that's actually globally relevant question, not just for Alma. Um, it really depends. It's it's external and internal factors. A lot of it is your own personality. You know what you what you like doing. How how long you can concentrate on one particular thing. Um, in, you know inertia of doing one project and how it just kind of keeps keeps going forever versus turning a lot of corners, which can sometimes be difficult. Uh, to answer your question. Um, I was, I consider myself to be lucky in the sense that I was trained at a really good time for doing what I do because I was trained at the peak of the, uh, the, the, the useful, wonderful life of karma, the previous telescope that I mentioned. And, and that really catapulted me into the Alma world right as I started doing my postdocs. Um, so I have continued with the general line of inquiry that I started back in graduate school because it was only just beginning when I was in grad school. And so we have, you know, kept going deeper, looking at more sources, looking at higher resolution, looking at different types of sources, looking at, at different uh, chemical tracers to get more information about the big question that I try to solve, which is, quote, the importance of the magnetic field in star formation. It's very, very general. So in a sense, I have been doing the same thing for 10 years, but that question is so general that it has allowed me to bounce around inside of that question, right? So that, that's generally been how I've worked. Although recently, actually, I've, I've started doing usually ALMA related, but sometimes even other telescopes, some very, very different stuff as sort of side projects. And that happens for those of you who are wondering how the scientific career progresses. Typically, as a graduate student, 
well, as an undergraduate, you're super focused on a little bit of research, but mostly on classes and graduating, right? Then as a grad student, you're super, super focused on generally one project. Maybe you can have a side project if you're lucky, but you got to get the PhD, right? And then as a postdoc, you start to branch out a little bit, but you need to publish a lot of papers. And so you focus on a couple of projects, but very intensely productively. And now I'm kind of getting toward the end of the postdoc phase. I'm, a, uh, I'm, a, I'm not a tenure track professor, but I'm a professor level within the NAOJ. And so I'm really starting to kind of move out into other areas. Other friends of mine who have different ways of attacking science, they did it much earlier. They, um, you know, they started working on multiple projects with really focusing on different physics with different telescopes earlier. Some people do totally the same thing with just more sources for many, many years. So it really kind of depends on your personality. But uh, Alma is a great place, especially if you're using Alma data. You know, sometimes within Alma, it might be more difficult to actually do a project that was fully focused on another telescope in which no one in the Alma building has expertise. But within Alma, there's an incredible array of science that you can do. And simply by walking down the hall, which we will hopefully be able to do again in the near future, <laughs> um, you can get ideas from, um, from colleagues who use Alma, but to do stuff that's totally out of your field. And so that actually does help you jump around, at least with side projects, if not with your main scientific focus um, in, the, uh, in the, the pursuits that you, uh, that you have scientifically. Thank you. That that sounds really cool. Uh, in fact, and I um, my second question was actually, um, in fact, about how the this um, pandemic issue uh, has affected um, uh, specifically Alma, but uh, astronomical observation in general. Yeah, well, it's affected everybody um, somewhat equally and then somewhat unequally. Um, Alma has, uh, has shut down, so the telescope is not operating. There's a caretaker team that are doing an excellent job making sure that things are, are you know, sort of under control. Um, <laughs> there was a big earthquake recently. I think now they're actually sending some people up there to, to, to do some of those, fix some of those things, but there's very little activity up at the site. But the pandemic has really brought out the best in the Alma community, um, in all of the executives in Europe, Japan, and North America as well, but in particular in Chile, where we've been pretty, pretty hard hit by the pandemic. And we actually, just today, a couple hours before I logged in to, to this talk, we had a symposium that was five minute talks by many, many people in all of the different departments, engineering, outreach, science, everybody, talking about what they've been doing during the pandemic. And an unbelievable amount of work has been done, in particular, very you know deep kind of upgrade work that people needed to do, planning work, long-term planning work for um, the coming years with Alma that they really didn't have time to do before in their everyday lives. And so a lot of productivity um, and kind of introspection has been, has been going on here and people have managed to be highly productive even given the adversity of being in small apartments, unable to go out for walks, even unable to take their pets out, you know, with their kids at home, having to homeschool. Tons of stuff has still gotten done, and it's been really great to be part of a community that has been so positive during this time. The intra-ALMA communication has been really, really excellent. Um, and so I think we're going to come out of this a lot stronger, um, and we're already coming out of it. We're actually transitioning for the, the offices in Santiago. We've transitioned to, into the next phase. I know every country, every institution has its own phases, but we have a, a multi-phase return to operations process, which has been the focus of most of the upper management. They've been doing a really, really good job about communicating to us how that's all gonna work. And there are separate return to operations plans for the site, which is currently still in total closure, and the headquarters office. And we've now moved into um, you know, step one of, of reopening the offices. So uh, things are, are looking good on the horizon and I'm really proud to be part of this this community who suffered a lot of adversity but really got a lot done and maintained strong positivity throughout. That's great and it's really good to know that uh, even though this is in fact something that um, has really impacted a lot on people's lives, uh, it's good to know that uh, these um, scientific projects continue 
um, the, the people that work on them uh, tirelessly continue uh, motivated and continue forwarding uh, the, um, the the you know the the fields the observations so everything um, and I now um, move to my um, to the final question which I think in a way uh, you already answered at least the first part which was essentially uh, asking you um, how you decided to go into uh, the field of astronomy uh, and um, um, you know, become involved with ALMA specifically. Um, but there's a, a second part uh, that I think you could uh, maybe address, which was um, what um, sort of general what advice would you give to people considering the, the field of astronomy in terms of, um, you know, their studies, uh, things they can work on uh, in addition to their studies, maybe explore uh, some some observations and research. Yeah, so um, advice in the sense of career advice? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so let's see, let me start by briefly stating that, um, you know, in addition to, be, to being generally interested in our cosmic origins, just like everybody else is, uh, my favorite part about being an astronomer is doing science with people. I, um, you know, I'm more productive sometimes when I'm working at home, but I really miss having the coffees and having the colloquia and having the random meetings at lunch with people because that's my favorite part of science is that it's fundamentally a collaborative effort. You know, you see the, the Alma picture of all of the lines connecting Chile to Europe, North America, East Asia, that's the Alma collaboration. You know, you know, in a in a in an Alma document, how it all works, but that's sort of the grand version of what I feel like my own life is. It's just connections between different people, where the whole is always greater than the sum of the parts. You know, you get a lot of ideas from people, you work together, and you can make these incredible scientific stories that are so much fun to put together because you're working with other people. So that's that's the reason why I love doing science, and the reason that people love doing science is different from person to person, and so. You know, I think everybody will tell you, do what you love, uh, but the reasons for loving it can be different. And so those, you know, those reasons may send you on different career paths. Um, in the, the reason that I, uh, well, the, I guess advice that I would give to people if you're interested in, in academics, um, a lot of, I think a lot of you all watching are, are undergraduates, I would say uh, start by by taking a course and see what you think. You know, I was a physics major actually at, at the University of Virginia. I took many, 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 many courses, but the uh, the ones that captured my attention the most, and <laughs> incidentally, I don't know if this is like a masochistic tendency that I have, but they were also the hardest courses I ever took <laughs> by a very preeminent theorist at UVA who's now in uh, at Oxford. Um, that really just kept me totally wrapped and it was only two or three courses, but that uh, the the intrigue of the cosmos that I got from there, and then once I started grad school, realizing the incredible, um, the wonderful feeling of collaboration and collective success that you can get from doing a project, doing a PhD project, and then later many other projects after you graduate. Um, if that if that piques your interest from the academic side, and then maybe you do a little research, as you mentioned, you know, uh, advice for people who maybe want to get stick their toe, stick their finger into the research world, I would say also try that because the reason that I actually ended up applying to grad school was not because of the courses themselves. That was the the intellectual side. You know, I was intellectually interested in many different things, but I did some research. Um, those of you in the U.S have the the REU program, the Research Experience for Undergraduates. It's, it's an NSF funded program. And there are many similar internship programs in other countries in the world. Doing that was really critical because it showed me the super fun parts and you know also the not super fun parts like data reduction until 11 p.m. in the dorm room where I was staying at the University of Rochester. You know, there's some things that are not totally sexy about being an astronomer. And doing even just a eight or 10 week summer internship or a you know, few hours a week internship during your studies, your undergraduate studies, will give you a feel for the reality of research. Um, and uh, you know, whether, 
whether the the benefits of whatever it is that you love about the science is thinking about the science or interacting with the people over coffee outweigh the annoyance of the grind you know there is a grind there's a grind in every 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 job um so i would say try a little bit of research you know go and talk to your professors they will have projects they will be interested they will be happy to mentor you um some more than others perhaps but you can go by by word of mouth for who who tends to be a very good uh, undergraduate or you know master's advisor um and you know another thing i would say my own personal perspective i have been in a lot of countries um i've worked i've lived in guatemala i have lived on both coasts of the us i now live in chile i briefly lived in japan and worked in Japan uh, before I moved to work in Chile for the NAOJ. I would say if you have the opportunity, if you want to pursue further studies, uh, even if you're just going to the next step from undergraduate, going to a master's, try a different country. Uh, see if, the, see if the, the global aspects of astronomy are attractive to you. You know, getting out of, you may need to learn another language, you know, or at least you need to learn a little bit of the home language, which is sometimes fun, sometimes daunting. But that's another thing that I didn't even realize that I loved when I was working in the US for all of my undergraduate, all of my grad school and my first postdoc. Now that I'm at Alma, I just love working here because it's the most international environment I've ever been to. In fact, when I apply for jobs now, I sort of, in my mind, I lament the fact that that in literally no other job that exists will I be able to walk down the hall and talk to a person from a different country every five minutes if I want to for like the next two hours. You know, it's, it's an unbelievable environment. And if you like, if you thrive on the international aspect of astronomy, which it truly is, and you like to travel, which eventually we will be able to do again because conferences are all over the world, collaborators are all over the world, you'll be doing telecons at four in the morning occasionally, especially if you live in Hawaii. But if you really like that kind of thing, if you're willing to move, if you're willing to travel a lot, it's an unbelievable opportunity. Um, and so, you know, then there's the other side of the story. It is academia. There are only a certain number of jobs as you go higher up. So you have to take that into account. Um, but uh, I would say if you, you know, test it out, test out the research, take some of the classes. Um, if you do a master's, try moving somewhere else, try doing a different project. Uh, and if you like it, check it out. And in the end, this is the thing that I always advise my own students, the skills that you learn are especially in this day and age of data science and high technology in Silicon Valley, incredibly useful. Most of my friends um, who got their PhDs around the time that I got mine have left astronomy. That is purely statistical. It's the way it works. As you go up to the professor ranks, there just aren't that many jobs. And not everybody wants to be a professor in the end. Some people love the aspects of astronomy that um, professors really don't need necessarily. A lot of the time to be a professor, you have to be a really good manager. You have to be juggling a lot of things. Some people just want to stay with their nose in the statistics, you know, and that's, that's okay. There are academic jobs out there for you, but there are also tons of interest industry jobs and lots of interest from those companies. Um, I can say this with 100% certainty because my friends are working for dozens of different companies across the world um, with those exact skills. Um, so, it's, uh, it's not a bad thing to pursue it all the way through a PhD or a postdoc and then decide that academia is not for you. That's, that's no problem, as long as you enjoy the ride along the way, because there are jobs after that. Very well, thank you very much, uh, Chad. I think that's um, brilliant advice. Um, and I, now I, I would just um, ask you uh, if there's anything else that you would like uh, before uh, wrapping up, if there's anything else you would like to, to say or any final statement, something like that. I think uh, <laughs> that uh, the advice I just gave is something I would like to, to sink in because I guess secretly I'm speaking from my own soul <laughs> you know, as, as one of those astronomers who's, who's on that, that path, enjoying every minute and yet you know, feeling my own bit of uncertainty, especially these days. So I think I'll let that let that sit there and simply thank you so much for this opportunity. This was uh, really great, very good questions. And um, yeah, thanks for 
for putting on a conference that uh, that gave a, a little window into Alma. Well, thank you very much for accepting the invitation for being available for this. Um, I wish you good luck in returning to uh, work, uh, hopefully soon, uh, with uh, with Alma. Um, and thank you again for participating. And thank you to everybody that's been watching us and that watches this later. Uh, we will still um, have a couple more sessions this week uh, to to close this uh, this cycle of um, of online sessions. Um, and um, everybody have a very nice day. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.